Captain Seth Miller looked out the viewport of the UNSS Mercy as it dropped out of FTL travel. Before them lay the war-torn planet of Centauri B-2, its surface pockmarked by explosions and scorched by weapons fire. This system had been embroiled in a brutal civil war for years, and the fighting had left many innocent civilians without access to food, water, medicine, and shelter. That's why Seth and his crew were here. The Mercy was one of many humanitarian aid vessels operated by the United Nations Stellar Aid and Relief Organization, delivering supplies and personnel to planets in crisis all across the galaxy. And right now, Centauri B, I, I needed their help more than ever. Begin scanning for signs of active combat, ordered Seth, and prepare a small security force to accompany our ground teams. Aye, sir, came the reply from his XO, Lieutenant Sakai. Scanners show residual radiation and weapons signatures consistent with a major battle near the equator, but it looks like fighting has ceased for now. Then let's not waste any more time. Dispatch the shuttles and prepare the cargo pods for orbital drop. Within minutes, two shuttles carrying engineers, medics and security forces launched from the Mercy and began their descent towards the war-torn surface. Escorting them were a dozen supply pods loaded with emergency rations, water, temporary shelters, and medicine. As they entered the atmosphere, the stark devastation became all too clear. Where once verdant forests and glittering cities stood, there was now only desolation and ruins. Yet even amidst such tragedy, the sight of the approaching humanitarian ships ignited a spark of hope amongst those left clinging to life down below. Perhaps help had finally arrived to end their suffering. The shuttles touched down at the coordinates indicated by their scans, right in the heart of a makeshift refugee camp. As the crew disembarked, they were greeted by the weary but welcoming faces of Centauri civilians. There were families huddled and torn, dirty clothes children crying from hunger, their sunken eyes betraying malnutrition the elderly and infirm sat slumped against temporary shelters, lacking the most basic medical care. Lieutenant Sakai, leading the security force, maintained a watchful eye as the perimeter was secured. The fighting may have moved on for now, but stray guerrilla forces still posed a threat. The other crew fanned out through the camp, assessing needs and beginning triage on those in most dire condition. Doctor. Alonzo Garcia rushed to the side of a young Centauri child wheezing and coughing up blood. His portable scanner confirmed his fears the boy had inhaled toxic dust from an explosive weapon and his lungs were failing. Alonzo quickly administered anti-inflammatories and sedatives, then called over a stretcher to evacuate the boy to the mercy for emergency surgery. Just in time too, a few more minutes untreated, and the child's prognosis would be grave. Meanwhile, Chief Petty Officer Raj Singh directed his engineering team as they assembled temporary shelters with materials from the supply pods. Their sturdy polymer alloy construction would provide refuge from the elements, as well as basic radiation shielding. Other crewmen distributed self-heating meal packets and purification tablets for water. Even simple things like blankets and clean clothes went a long way to boosting morale. Word of the foreigners' arrival and their mission of mercy spread rapidly through the refugee camps and into the surrounding areas. Before long, Centauri civilians began arriving by the dozen, seeking food, shelter, and medical aid. The human crew worked tirelessly to help as many as they could, their advanced technology and compassionate dedication bringing comfort to the beleaguered people. After several hours, the shuttle's fuel cells neared depletion, requiring a return to the Mercy to recharge. But the crews vowed to come back the next day with more supplies and personnel. Their mission had only just begun. Upon returning to the ship, Captain Miller decided to broadcast a general message on all local frequencies, addressed to all warring factions. This is Captain Seth Miller of the United Nations Starship Mercy. We represent the United Nations Stellar Aid and Relief Organization on a mission of humanitarian relief for civilians caught in your conflict. We come unarmed, with only supplies and medical aid. We hold no allegiance in your war. Our sole purpose is to prevent further loss of innocent life from lack of basic needs. Please allow us to carry out our mission unimpeded. We ask for a temporary ceasefire and safe passage as we render aid. You have our word we will remain neutral and uninvolved in military actions. The message repeated on loop, broadcasting across the planet like a beacon of light piercing the fog of war. There was no reply at first, and the crew anxiously wondered if their call had fallen on deaf ears. The next day the relief shuttles set out again, 
this time escorted by a pair of light interceptors, should they meet any hostile forces. As they descended once more into the bleak landscape, the crew braced themselves for potential confrontation. But to their surprise, no resistance awaited them. In fact, as they approached the refugee camp, they saw figures emerging from makeshift bunkers and trenches all around the perimeter. Centauri civilians and guerrilla fighters alike gathered to welcome the returning ships. Exhausted smiles of gratitude met the crew as they disembarked. Clearly their message of neutrality and humanitarianism had resonated, at least with some factions. These people now looked upon the foreign aid workers, not as potential threats, but as their only glimmer of hope in a long dark night. The Mercy's crew worked from dawn to dusk treating the sick and wounded, providing food and shelter, reuniting children with their families. After months of endless violence, even a brief respite seemed like a miracle to these war-weary civilians. But the next day, as the shuttles returned on their regular route from the Mercy, they detected missile lock-on warnings. Captain Miller's voice burst over the comms yelling evasive maneuvers. The pilots banked the shuttles hard just as a barrage of surface-to-air missiles streaked past where they had been seconds earlier. One of the interceptor escorts swerved into the path of a missile, destroying it at the cost of heavy damage to its starboard wing. It seemed yesterday's welcome had just been the calm before the storm. Now hidden anti-air batteries were active, trying to drive off the aid ships, but the crews were undeterred. They had come too far to turn back now. The pilots expertly jinked and swerved through the missile fire, while Miller coordinated suppressive strikes from the Mercy's laser turrets in low power mode, disabling the AAA guns with pinpoint strikes. After a tense few minutes, the bombardment ceased. It seemed even the hostile factions down below hesitated to fire on the humanitarian vessels once their destructive capabilities became clear. The shuttles completed their descent and offloaded their relief supplies at the refugee camp without further incident. But the crew knew they weren't out of danger yet. Over the next week, the aid mission continued, but not without frequent close calls. The Mercy sensors reported sporadic weapons fire and movement indicative of advancing ground forces. It seemed the various factions were exploiting the lull in violence brought about by the relief efforts to regroup and mount fresh offensives. Captain Miller knew it was only a matter of time until the ceasefire collapsed completely. That day came sooner than expected. As the shuttles were on their final approach for the day's delivery, new missile warnings blared. These were larger munitions, likely of vehicle-mounted origin. The pilots took evasive action, dispersing the shuttle formation. Flak exploded all around them. One shuttle took a glancing hit to its port stabilizer. Another lost primary power for several heart-stopping seconds before its backup generator kicked in. But both shuttles managed to skirt the artillery bombardment and touch down safely at the landing zone. The crews offloaded their cargo with haste, even as distant sounds of renewed ground combat echoed. Civilians fled in panic towards the newly built shelters and bunkers surrounding the camp. Militia fighters took up defensive positions to guard against imminent attack. It seemed a major government offensive had begun. Armored personnel carriers and mechs were advancing under heavy artillery cover towards guerrilla-held population centers. The humanitarian aid in the camp was now trapped behind enemy lines. The shuttle crews finished unloading and began emergency launch prep as enemy forces closed in. But to everyone's surprise, no attack came. As the dust clouds raised by the advancing army's tracks came into view, they stopped short of the camp's perimeter. For a brief moment, relief shuttles and Centauri guerrillas stood side by side watching in suspense. Then came a message over military frequencies, unexpectedly addressed to Captain Miller. It was the Regional Commanding General of Government Forces. He demanded the aid workers immediately withdraw from enemy territory for their own safety. Fighting was about to commence and he could not guarantee their protection. The captain responded resolutely they would not abandon civilians in need, regardless of military action. But he did request the general honor a three-kilometer non-combat zone surrounding the refugee camp, so their work could continue unimpeded. For several intense minutes there was only silence as both sides awaited the general's decision. His forces could easily overwhelm the camp's meager defenses, but did he dare openly attack neutral aid workers? In the end, pragmatism won out. The general agreed to hold his forces outside the non-combat zone, but only until the relief crews completed their extraction. He would not tolerate what he saw as the enemy using foreign civilians as de facto human shields. With the clock now ticking, 
the aid teams rushed to load the remaining civilians in most critical need onto the shuttles. Minutes later, the craft ascended back to the Mercy under heavy fighter escort, just as artillery pounded guerrilla positions around the camp's perimeter. It was a temporary reprieve at best. They had managed to evacuate 243 civilians, but over a thousand more remained behind in the still besieged camp. As Captain Miller watched sensor feeds of the unfolding battle, he struggled with feelings of guilt over leaving any innocents behind. But he knew to remain any longer would risk both their shuttles and the mercy itself. In all, they had evacuated over 600 civilians over two weeks of daring aid operations. While just a fraction of the planet's afflicted population, it was far more than if they had not come at all. Furthermore, for those evacuated, the recovery of their health and spirit had begun aboard the Mercy, even as chaos still engulfed their homeworld. The mission was declared over, at least this phase. The Mercy could not withstand a direct assault if the fighting escalated. But as the ship accelerated away from Centauri B, II towards safe harbor, Captain Miller made a vow this would not be the end. The Stellar Aid and Relief Organization would return to provide humanitarian assistance whenever possible, for as long as it took, until peace was restored. Reports of the Mercy's exploits made their way across Centauri and even into the wider galaxy. How its crew selflessly fought against impossible odds to bring aid and comfort into the depths of war's dark despair. How they asked nothing in return but good faith and safety to carry out their mission. How they risked their lives without taking sides, seeing only people in need. In time, the story of the Vanguard of Hope became legend, and it was spoken of with reverence and gratitude even by former enemies, for word had spread that whenever humanity arrived offering open hands instead of fists, it meant a light in the darkness signaling here at least, life endures.